Morning, ladies, gentlemen, lady and gentlemen. Uh, so our session today really sets the stage for the two days of the conference today. And I wanted to start off first by giving our audience a sense of who you are. So if we could do uh, one sentence to describe your fund, what it, what it is that you do or invest in, and one sentence to describe the most successful startup you've invested in, or the most interesting startup you've invested in. But success would be probably a better metric, because for the emerging ones, we're going to discuss in a short bit. So uh, would you like to start, uh, Dillian? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, all. My name is Dillian Dimitrov. I'm a partner at one of the largest and most active accelerators in Europe called Eleven, uh, operating from Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, one of the most interesting startups we have, all right? Uh, we have two guys which are building a cargo drone, which is actually a plane that can carry about 350 kilos of payload uh, over about 1,000 kilometers. So we heard that the UAE was going to use drones for delivery, but it sounds like you guys are building the technology that's going to let them do that. The idea is, you know, this is kind of our first market. Excellent. Matthew? I'm Matthew Johnson. I'm a partner at 500 Startups. 500 Startups is the world's most active and most global seed stage investor. Um, uh, we invested early and often in a company called Twilio, which just recently became our latest uh, billion dollar valued company. Excellent. And hopefully many more to come. Pamir. Hi, I'm Pamir Gillenby uh, from Hummingbird Ventures. So we're also a seed and early stage fund. Um, we've been around for 12 years. We're into our fifth fund now. Um, so we've invested in uh, about four companies in the MENA region, about six companies in Turkey, um, and over 15 companies in Europe. Uh, our most successful investment in the MENA region is um, uh, probably Marka VIP, uh, a company that we've seeded. Um, our um, most successful investments in Turkey, I think two companies are, are uh, jockeying for that are um, Shikseypeti, one of the largest e-commerce players in Turkey, which Amazon also recently invested in, um, as well as Peak Games, which is a fast-growing games company that builds its own games for the whole world out of Turkey, um, has 100 people there, and is very profitable now. Um, so um, I think I'm already over the limit. Great. And yeah. Chichek Sepeti for, for our audience is, is a 1-800-Flowers type business model, right? Yeah, I mean, it's more than that. That's how they started. They started as a marketplace connecting uh, small flower shops all across Turkey with, with customers uh, from Turkey and from around the world. Um, and now they've branched out into five or six different vertical categories in e-commerce. Thank you. Naz. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> I'm working for Atomico. It's a later stage fund that is founded by Nicholas Sandstrom, which was one of the founders of Skype. So we're currently investing from our third fund, uh, the latest fund, and we are investing globally. We have investments in like Europe mainly, but also in US, uh, Russia, Japan, China. Um, and thinking about our most successful investment, it's probably, it's also like this close, so it's uh, Supercell, which is like a gaming company. Uh, the developers of Clash of Clans, Heyday, and Boom Beach. Uh, so they have been acquired, like 51% of the stake was acquired by SoftBank at the end of 2013 for a $3.1 billion valuation. So that's probably the one that's uh, worth highlighting. Great. Clash of Clans. How many people here have seen a Clash of Clans ad on Facebook? Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressive marketing, guys. Exactly. So, um, and Pavel. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Pavel Tirintif. I'm the founder of... Um, Adventure Venture, uh, capital firm. We uh, we are one of the most active uh, seed and um, early stage investors in Russia. We uh, focus on mostly uh, focus on e-commerce in the broad sense. We invest in marketplaces, uh, aggregation, lead generation models, vertically integrated businesses. Um, sector wise, that's food tech, furniture. Uh, probably the one of the one of the most successful uh, investment was uh, was a food uh, food delivery marketplace uh, in Russia called Del Delivery Club. That's a kind of uh, Russian talabat or a Mexipit that was sold to Food Panda last year. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. So uh, very interesting uh, gathering of investors. We've looked at now what the biggest uh, success stories or some of the biggest valuations that you've achieved. Now let's look at what's coming next, right? 
what are the most interesting new startups, very early stage that you've been investing in or looking at? Uh, and if not, the kind of early stage deals that you're seeing done that are attracting your attention and giving you a sense of a trend that's coming up that is a very interesting trend. That, that's a long question maybe. Let's start with identifying new interesting startups coming out that you think are uh, indicative of a interesting new trend. I'm going to start with that. Or Pamir. Sure. Perfect. So um, um, now, now I'm going to disclose my hidden agenda, which is really to talk about Bitcoin. So, okay. so how, how many people here have a Bitcoin wallet? Yeah, about 10 people. Um, great. So uh, w one of the trends that we're um, uh, very excited about at Hummingbird is, um, uh, is distributed ledger technology in Bitcoin. So we made our first investment in this field about a year ago in a company based in San Francisco called Kraken, um, which is a Bitcoin exchange which lets you buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, and uh, right now what makes them special is that they are number one in the Euro Bitcoin pair. So if you want to buy Euros for Bitcoin or if you want to buy Bitcoin for Euros, you, want, you go on Kraken. It's the best exchange to do that. Um, and more generally, we're very excited about Bitcoin because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very disruptive technology that um, takes money away from government. So historically, money, as historically as in for the last you know, 500 years or whatever, money was issued by government. So government would, would, would um, print money, quite literally, uh, paper or coins. Um, now they can issue money electronically through the banks. Um, uh, but if you think about it, that wasn't always the case. You know, in the past, people used gold, for example, as a means of exchange. They used commodities and assets. And Bitcoin actually is closer to that in concept. So Bitcoin is like a digital commodity. It's something you cannot fake, you cannot forge. Even though it's digital, you cannot copy it and reproduce it because it Amir, uses... What's the potential for that? Yeah. The, in so, the disruptive potential. Of yeah. That. So the potential is, uh, there, are, there are many things. So there are probably about eight or ten very large industries are going to get disrupted by, um, by this technology. So one of them is uh, remittances and money transfers, which I think is very relevant also to this part of the world. So um, uh, with Bitcoin, you can transfer you know, 20, 30, 50 million dollars or 10,000 dollars or even as little as five dollars or ten dollars to anyone around the world with no transaction fee and instantly with no intermediary. No need to go to the bank, no need to go online. You can just do this on your Bitcoin wallet on your phone, for example. So that's very, very disruptive in itself. Um, Bitcoin is also going to disrupt the merchant processing industry. So um, right now, if you want to buy something on an e-commerce site, you have to pull out your credit card. Or here, I guess you've got cash on delivery as well. But mostly, people use credit cards to buy things online. Um, the credit card industry as a whole takes uh, 1 to 2% of that transaction fee for offering that service. Now, with Bitcoin, there's a potential to reduce those transaction fees down to pretty much zero. Um, and that's, again, a major disruption in a very large industry. Um, Bitcoin also has the potential to, so one more big one that's very relevant to Dubai, sorry, actually two more. So uh, Bitcoin has, has, has the potential to disrupt the banking industry as well, especially in areas where people are not banked, you know, areas where it's too expensive to bank individuals. Because with a Bitcoin wallet, which is basically an app you download on your phone, you have a way of storing money, you have a way of sending money, and a way of receiving money. And you can all do that right now on your phone, whether you're on iOS or Android. Um, and then, so that's, that's huge in terms of emerging markets. I think, I think we're going to hold that thought for the all next right. question. Okay, hold I'll it for the up. next question. So Bitcoin, we have a clear lobbyist here for Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, we actually have, we're, we're very interested in fintech. It's on the cover of our magazine. It's in a panel tomorrow, transfer-wise. We'll be speaking tomorrow as well. Right. We think it's a huge uh, wave of innovation that's coming in that space as well. Who wants to take next? Matthew. Oh, so at 500, we see video everywhere. We see new platforms and old platforms, YouTube, um, Facebook video, Periscope, Meerkat. We see companies that are uh, building incredibly fast using video as a primary user acquisition channel. Um, we see mobile video creating this incredible infrastructure problem of bandwidth. Um, we are a couple of companies that we're investing in our marketplaces, uh, 
that use video as a primary distribution channel. Uh, one would be a company called Ipsy, that's a makeup brand uh, where one of the co-founders is a YouTube celebrity. Um, the revenue ramp is incredible there. Another company that I'm an investor in is a company called 99Gamers that's a secondary marketplace for both physical and digital video games. Um, and uh, they're building off platforms like Twitch and YouTube, um, these video platforms that incumbents don't think about. And even if they do think about them, they don't engage creatively. So, but you're talking here in many ways about video as a tool and not video as uh, a startup itself. Uh, it's everywhere. It's incumbents and startups. It's Periscope versus Meerkat. It's, you know, buying advertising directly on YouTube. It's uh, everything about video. Great. Well, again, we're aligned. Yeah. Last panel tomorrow will be on video with all these players. So, yeah. yes, J hit just, me, Jillian. Yeah, j just to give you some background, uh, I'm coming from Europe, and uh, Europe is very fragmented market in terms of languages. So uh, business to consumer is not big in Europe, and it's really difficult to get something business to consumer, uh, like in the States, let's say. Uh, but what we see as a trend, and we see probably about 20% of our startups in, are in that domain, there is this movement called digitalization of the enterprise software, uh, actually consumerization of that software. So, so this, imagine software as a service which is for a particular vertical. I mean, we have it for veterinary clinics, we have it for beehive keepers, we have it for lawyers and law firms. I mean, you just think of a vertical, and then all these small and medium companies which cannot afford installing and integrating SAP or you know, Microsoft Dynamics, they have a solution which is particularly tailored for them. And, and with the growth of SMEs in, in Europe in particular, I mean, it's like a big trend that's actually coming. And, and it's not so affected by the uh, language barrier uh, because just people just speak English in businesses. So you can launch uh, from any place to any other place. Very, inter very interesting. So we're talking about vertical focused software as a service. Yep. Naz? So uh, we have done like a quick research on like billion dollar companies uh, that is founded after like 2003. And one thing that strikes us is that before like 2008, uh, the, there are like two main verticals that billion dollars, billion dollar businesses are created. But when you come today, they're like attacking in like 12 different sectors. So um, we are seeing the trend that like more and more entrepreneurs have maybe like the guts to attack the decadent industries. And one of them that we are like having like a closer look is like delivery. But we are not like only talking like B2C, like Postmates or like food delivery, but like really decadent ones like that hasn't been disrupted for 30 years, like, you know, container shipment businesses. So uh, there have been interesting startups coming up in that aspect from like mainly in like Nordics. So I believe once um, entrepreneurs have the courage to attack those like different verticals, um, like and even like decadent ones like insurance or like those core uh, shipment uh, container shipments or like education that are like trillion dollar industries that will be the maybe the next large uh, disruption uh, that we're seeing so it sounds like you guys agree as well in terms of focusing on disrupting verticals yeah. right major traditional verticals being disrupted uh, Pavel well, given our, given our uh, e-commerce background, we do believe that uh, there is a huge uptake in the, in the marketplaces. And if you uh, look more broadly into the different verticals, it's apparently like FinTech, the Lending Club is a huge story. Uh, I don't know, Airbnb, it has like more inventory than the largest uh, real estate group uh, across the world, the hotel group probably, yeah? Um, uh, so, uh, in, uh, in this segment, we, we do see that in the next, like, three years, there will be, like, dozen of the billion companies across the, uh, the Europe, MENA, and uh, uh, Asia. Uh, in particular, this, is, uh, this relates to the vertically integrated e-commerce, uh, where the, uh, the brands don't have to uh, compete with another, uh, with, uh, for the customers with the commodity um, uh, product, like white and brown goods. So when you have like your own brand, you control the uh, production chain, 
that's the huge value proposition and uh, well look at Bonobos, Warby Parker and uh, yeah we do believe in this. Uh, so you're not talking about pure play e-commerce sites, you're talking about brands that manufacture clothes doing their own e-commerce activities. Exactly, that's one part of the story and the, the marketplace is the, uh, the solution that facilitates the transaction between the, the vendor and the customer uh, and helps the customer to make the transaction faster and more easier. Uh, the I don't know, the services marketplace, uh, look at FarmTech in, in the United States, we are looking at a few stories in, um, across the region here in India. Uh, the Uber-like services when you can just uh, push one button and have uh, uh, whatever you want deliver it or render it to you. Um, so I, I want to jump into a question here that's interesting to me. Um, emerging markets. We are seeing a lot of copycats, right? We can call them copycats. Uh, let's use instead the word uh, exist proven business models being replicated in uh, emerging markets. Um, is this the right way to invest? Should we be investing in these? Should we be looking for globally innovative b business models? I hear a lot of us talking about the same thing in terms of our experience, but we are still talking about the Airbnb or the Uber or the whatever it is of our local markets. What do you guys think? It's a no-brainer to win a big category in a region that you know to be proven. Yeah, but there is a caution to that. I mean, not all businesses are easy to replicate in any market. I mean, we've seen kind of proven models tried and tested and failing in, let's say, Central Eastern Europe because the market is specific. I think it's the same about it. It's about culture, but it's also about, you know, maturity of a market. What percentage of the ideas or startups that you're investing in are new, new business models? Zero. Zero. Wow. Just because... Uh, probably about 80 to 90. 80 to 90. Yeah. But you're early stage. Yeah, we are. Yes. Okay. Naz? We will be less. I mean, maybe 20, like 20 new business models. will be new. Yeah, exactly. Come here. So it's a mix because um, we've invested in a lot of businesses that are in the data center technology space. It's something we've done historically for the last 10 years and something we've done quite successfully. Just a month and a half ago, we sold one company that we had seeded and uh, we're the largest investor in um, called uh, Ampli Data to Western Digital for $300 million. And it's a space we like. We've had a number of exits. Um, we work with a number of entrepreneurs in that space that we've backed several times. Um, so, and in that space, everything we do is, is, is new IP. It wouldn't, it's not necessarily a new business model. So I think your question is not so much about the business model because the business model is, you know, you're selling software licenses, you're selling cloud, you know, technologies or whatever. So the, the business model is always the same, but in this case, those are IP intensive companies that are innovating in their field. Um, so we, we, we've really done both. We've done companies where there's a lot of innovation that have a global market. Um, and we've done that both in Europe and in Turkey, for example. Um, uh, and we've also done uh, business models you could, you could qualify as copycats, although in reality, they all have to adapt to their local market circumstances. So, for example, Marca VIP here, you could say is a copycat of, or was, of, of Vantrivé and whatever, but the company has evolved so much over the last five years that I wouldn't call it a copycat anymore because it's really had to adapt to the specific customer needs in this region. Okay. So why is it, and I'll address this to the zero and 20%, right? Why is this that it's, so we are seeing so few globally innovative business models? Or is it because you're more uh, apt to invest in a proven business model? Or is it because the ideas that are coming to you are uh, existing business models or existing business, whatever we want to call it, sorry. I think, I mean, for our sense, we, we're later stage investors, so we, like at the stage that it comes to us, we probably expect that it is like sort of proven that we don't like take too much risk. Um, I mean, we have invested two companies in our latest fund that has no monetization like whatsoever because like we believe in the team and like there is like something bigger in that than like monetizing in the like, next two years. Uh, but I think it's just like the nature of being like a later stage fund. Um, and I think Right now, like I, I agree with Pamir, like even though they're like an emerging market and maybe they're just like assumed as like copycats, there's a lot of like localization need that is, is going on, and you're like competing with like the developed market players, anyways, because like now all of them, especially if their domestic market is like smaller, the internationalization uh, year has dropped like significantly, so they're like 
going global faster. So, I mean, there is no harm on just like investing into like a local player that has been, you know, just like started the competition earlier and all those companies are coming to those regions anyway. So, Pavel, you're, you're shaking your head in agreement. I do agree. Well, we are, you know, we are the, the, the VC firm. So we invest our own money and the money that, you know, people are uh, giving to us. So it's apparently it's much safer to invest into the model that, you know, that has been already proved somewhere. That's the first point. And another point is that local, localization is a huge sort of uh, hustle. Uh, for example, with the food delivery marketplaces, we, we have competed with Yemexipeti coming to Russia. We have competed with Food Panda coming to Russia. We have competed with Delivery Hero looking into Russia. I mean, the three major international players, uh, deep pocket players, so they invested like huge money, especially Rocket. And nevertheless, I mean, our, uh, upon, upon, upon the exit, uh, our, our business has uh, had like 90% uh, market share. Okay, so, uh, and but I understand and that it, logic, right? Not, we say we have, to, we have to keep our LPs in mind, we have to make sure we return on the money that people gave us. Um, so, good. Another question. One technology that you think people are underestimating. People have not seen the full potential or impact of this technology. And it could be a technology or it could be a, a, a trend, I guess, as well. Yeah, I would say that uh, wearables are clearly the platforms of the future. What's unclear today is how long it's going to take for them to become mainstream. In your video, you showed a little bit about the Apple Watch. It's just one class of wearable. Um, just through logic, um, there are not many ideas that you see uh, that have even the potential to be a new pl class of platforms like a laptop, like a smartphone, like a PC, and wearables are it. Uh, it's unclear whether uh, this will come to pass in five years or ten years or two years. What, what's holding back the wearables in your opinion? Uh, technology and applications and killer apps and awareness and pretty much everything. Like, it's just really early days, right? Other technologies you think people are underestimating? Bitcoin <laughs> and distributed ledger technology, which underpins it. Okay. Uh, I think I mean, we, we have several startups which are investing in big data. And if you remember the like, big trend of big data at some point of time, and then it kind of died away. So not very, very many people are talking about big data right now. But I think the more the world is g digitized, the more information is getting together. And right now, we are making little use of that you know, information. But at some point of time, computers will be able to know pretty much exactly what you're doing right now, what you need, what you want to buy. Uh, so, so at some point of time, it will be so predictable, uh, particularly for marketers. That's going to be a great you know, thing. Great. I love that. I, I, I mean, I think what you're saying is big data leading into some kind of artificial intelligence. It's, it's going this way. Other places where you see big data have an interesting opportunity? Um, or any specific verticals or specific? We, the, the companies we, we work with, uh, they're investing particularly into uh, intelligence, kind of company intelligence. So you can look at the market and you have like early signals for anything that's changing in your particular marketplace. So what they're doing is they're grinding through all the news sources that you have and actually giving you some insight about sentiment, opinion, uh, you know, stuff like this. So what they were saying is if you're able to kind of tap onto those early signals, you'll be very good at predicting the future. I mean, they were playing with several companies that actually crashed and collapsed on the market. And, you know, based on historic data, they could predict that this would happen. So if you are that company, you would love to have that information early on. So, so, so we, we are using it for that. So financial part. markets, marketing? Particularly marketing, uh, company intelligence, financial, financial pl pr projections and plans. Speaking of crashes, I'll open, I'll make this question wider. Uh, a technology that failed or uh, a trend that failed or a company that, that we thought was going to be amazing and then turned out to not be as successful. 
and I can name Fab as one. You know. Well, I would but, say what, what we see a lot is that uh, even though Uber and Airbnb were very successful, that doesn't mean that that model translates well to any other vertical that an entrepreneur might want to assert as Uber for X or Airbnb for Y. Not everything is a marketplace just because you have low margins and s multiple subcontractors. Uh, you know, not everything is Uber if you push a button and get it. Wow. Yeah, I think not everything is a marketplace. Nazem, I'd love to hear your comment on this because you were talking about the, the, and Pablo as well, both of you were talking about marketplaces. What are your thoughts on this? Can everything become a marketplace? Not everything. I think, or, like, yeah, I, I think the local dynamics, like, creates a lot of, like, uh, difference in that. Because, like, like, I'm living in London, and I, like, half of the time, like, I'm, I'm in Turkey and I'm Turkish. So, like, the difference between, like, using cleaning services and the, the charge of it and, like, what we use in Turkey uh, or like in London, which like I order like a cleaning lady hourly basis is like totally different. So I think, for example, specifically for service marketplaces, the local dynamics will play like a big difference on either those companies will adapt to those local dynamics or like there will be some sort of like Or they won't failures. succeed. Exactly. Yeah, they yeah. won't succeed. Exactly. So I think like it's, it's like a big question mark. Uh, that we have and also like trust is a big issue in some markets it's not like in developed markets it's just like given you know just like people sort of like trust each other or there's like a check system while in other countries it's just like still like a big question mark the use of like online for like having those services so let's, I think that's like maybe one one thing to bear in mind let's drop all the audience how many people here have used an Airbnb uh, Airbnb anywhere raise your hands high so we can see properly great how many people have used a Talabat or a food ordering service of any kind here? Okay. Uh, what service do you think people would not use? What thing could not be turned into a marketplace? Okay, so I was going to answer the former question on the latter question. So um, I, I wanted to echo the comments on on-demand services which the panelists have made. So um, I guess partly because of the rise of Uber, partly because of the you know, ubiquity of smartphones now, number of companies are coming up with um, various on-demand services that allow you to get services fulfilled at a touch of a button on your phone. Um, I, I was at an event last week in San Francisco called the On-Demand Services Conference um, where all sorts of entrepreneurs were mingling and, and talking about their on-demand services. So I met somebody who did um, um, on-demand uh, you know, bouncers for, for, for nightclubs, for example. So, <laughs> you know, it sounds interesting, but, you know, you think about the market opportunity, how big that is, and, and, you, and you think about um, things like um, not getting disintermediated, because once the bouncer meets the nightclub, chances are they, they might just go off the marketplace and do a deal by themselves and without your help. And I think that's also what some of the um, on-demand services for cleaning have been suffering from, the fact that they are getting disintermediated over time. Um, so, um, so I would I would echo the general sentiment that uh, there's a lot of positive energy in this space. I'm not in any way dismissing this space. I think it's a very exciting space. We actually made two investments in that space in the last six months. So it's a space we're taking very seriously. But I think, like a lot of spaces, you have to be a little bit discerning where you you know where you put your bets. You have to look at the market opportunity, the likelihood of being disintermediated, um, and how much of a problem you really solve. And is it about how personal it is? I mean, like, maybe it's about uh, I wouldn't get a babysitter through a platform like this. Would people get a babysitter through a platform like this? How many people here would go through a marketplace for a babysitter? But that ex it does exist, yes? Care.com does things like this. Oh, yeah. This, yeah. Right? And it's a, it's a it's massive not, company, yeah, huge. But it's, but it's not on demand. So the, the whole on demand thing is like you touch a button and they show up like 10 minutes later, right? Okay, but it's not necessarily on demand. Let's say marketplaces more broadly because that was, that was Matthew's yeah. point initially. Yeah, I, I mean, there are dynamics of a particular purchase that lend themselves to on-demand or not. In a taxi, clearly you want it now. Home cleaning, you don't necessarily. Uh, almost no one needs a cleaning now. They might need one next week or once a, once a month or twice a month. I would, I would add to that. I mean, there is one thing about marketplaces, and it's about retention. So any kind of marketplace needs, I mean, talking about bouncers, and, you know, Pamir was right. 
you go and find one bouncer and then he becomes your bouncer of the club, right? Uh, there are other things which are not recurring demands. Uh, so Airbnb is great because you go to different places every time and you need a place to stay or um, you know Uber is a great you know example as well because you need cars you know to, to rent uh, you know every every other hour if you're in a new city but there are other economies where there is no such thing as repetitive demand or if there is you meet once the people that provide it and you are going to work with them so so there are some industries that are subject to kind of this type of marketplaces and others which don't Okay, um, I want to jump to another topic. Uh, we saw in, the, in our video earlier, and we're seeing globally speaking, what we're saying, the internationalization of unicorns, right? Increasing unicorns coming out of the East. Uh, beyond a few success stories, Flipkart, Xiaomi, a couple, a couple of these, Chinese companies in particular, China and India being massive markets, Yandex and Russia, right? Is this really a trend? Naz, you had, you had yeah. some, something you wanted to say, and then we'll go to Matthew. Yeah, I mean, as, as I like, mentioned earlier, like based on our research, um, like all the companies that like billion dollar companies that comes from like, uh, that has a population left less than 50 million in their like domestic markets have all gone like international. And when we look at it like currently out of like 183 billion dollar companies founded after like 2003, uh, like 65% still comes from like Silicon Valley but China is following them behind with like 33 uh, billion dollar companies and above like 90% of them are like domestic currently. But we see Domestic as in only serving their local market. Exactly. 90% of unicorns are today domestic. No, from China. From China. Exactly, okay. yeah. But we see a trend like from like WeChat, Line, like those companies are coming, you know, like to develop markets or like attacking like this region, like Turkey. So I guess we believe that the next wave will be like Asian companies going like international because there's like a bigger appetite. Um, and we, when we look at like the lifespan also, the, the time that it takes for billion dollar companies before 2008 to go international, it was around like 3.4 years while now it's just like it has gone down to 1.4 years. So the, the companies are going international faster and we believe like the Asian companies uh, will be going global pretty soon. Okay, I want to review these stats just because I think they're pretty amazing and impressive. 65% of unicorns coming out of Silicon Valley or yeah. over billion dollar companies coming out of Silicon Valley. Yeah. Does that mean that 35 are coming out of not Silicon Valley or not the United States? Not Silicon Valley. Not Silicon Valley. Exactly. What percentage outside of the United States today? Do you have a sense of that number? No, no I haven't. Okay. Uh, and before 2008, it took 3.4 years to build a billion dollar business. Uh, after 2008, it took an average of 1.4 years to build a billion dollar business. No, to go global. To so, go global. Exactly, to go international. To go international. Exactly. Okay, good. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that we're all clear on these because they're pretty Im impressive statistics. Um, other thoughts on the topic? Matthew. So I was just going to say that we're investors in a company called Grab Taxi, which is like Uber in Southeast Asia. and. In my view, the reason you're seeing these high valuations outside the United States is because uh, these big obvious land grabs opportunities, like nothing could be more obvious than Uber in Southeast Asia or some other region, are extremely competitive. And because they're so obvious, they require uh, you to capitalize, to just raise a ton of money to fend off actual Uber, to fend off everyone else, to fend off Rocket Internet. So that's where you get the high valuations from. It's building a giant war chest to win, to try and win this, go all in at the poker table and win this big obvious land grab opportunity. It's not like, it's not like a big fish that eats. I saw this uh, picture on the LinkedIn. <laughs> it's not like the big fish that eats the small fish. That's the fast fish that it's the slow fish. Okay. So that's, that's the difference now. That should be a Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but interesting, right? The nimbler company potentially can beat out the larger company that is not as aware, as we've discussed repeatedly on this session, kind of local cultural nuances that are required in building uh, a successful uh, local business model. Um, so, Talabad.com, largest acquisition here in the Middle East. There was some debate among the investor community. Should Talabat have sold for $170 million? Should they have held out, raised more money, 
and tried to IPO the business to return more value to their uh, local investors and more value to the local market? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question. I think more faster exits are the absolute key to developing a regional ecosystem of technology startups because then you get the early investors who like that taste of getting some money out even if it's not a billion dollars even if it's 170 million then they'll take the they'll take those gains and they'll put that money back to work in more startups and their friends who you know wish they were in on that deal will start investing in more startups so i think it's sort of the pace and velocity of exits that return capital to bring more angels and investors into the market is incredibly important. So I think it's a great thing that they sold. So interesting. So pace of acquisitions, more important frequency, more important, you believe, in ecosystem yeah. building than necessarily size. Because they, they left Bo a lot of... Both are important, clearly. Right. They, they left a lot of value on the table. In theory, if they could have built this out successfully, they could have been a billion dollar company. Why not, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think... like. Biggest thing for uh, ecosystem, like secondary startup ecosystems, is there just are not a lot of exits because there aren't a lot of natural acquirers uh, in the same market, and so like when when there's opportunity uh, to have like a reasonable win, generally uh, it's kind of a good thing for the region. Amir, you looked like you had a thoughts on this topic as well. No, actually, no, uh, I, I wasn't privy to to tell about um, you know private details of the companies. It's really hard to answer your question without. Really knowing much more about the company, but I would just echo your comments. I think it's a great, uh, great, great event for this ecosystem, um, and, um, and and I'm ha very happy it happened. I think it's good for all of us. Okay, good. Anyone have different thoughts that they would they would want to add on this topic? Okay, um, so then let's jump to, to the next point that you raise. Why do we? What what is needed to get more M and A here in these markets? What do we need to get more acquisitions happening in emerging markets more broadly? How do we attract the interest of the global players and or investors? So, or is this just a matter of time? So I have a strong view on this one. So um, we're really not bothered about exits um, and acquisition when we invest in companies. We're only the only thing we worry about is building great companies. So um, uh, you know we you know com our view is companies are bought, not sold. Uh, so, um, you know, if you build a great company um, over, you know, five to ten years, um, I think the, you know, the exit process or, or the exit, whatever it is, will take care of itself. So I think the focus should be on building great companies, not, not being over obsessed about exits right from the start. That's, that's, our, per that's our view in the fund. Exactly. Fully I like that support. philosophy. Fully support. And uh, th there is always like a lag between the, the, the seed and the early stage investments and like the next stage uh, exits. Normally it takes like, I don't know, three to five years. So you have to first invest into the, uh, into the ecosystem, into the, uh, into the businesses, grow them. So but then I hear from you guys, we should just build great companies and cross our fingers? Yeah. I mean, I think for this region, as IPO is not really like... Um, the obvious route, like specifically for Turkey and like for this region. I mean, if you create create great companies that create value for like consumer and like build a defensible um, like a system, I think it's just like obvious when the time comes, you're like the obvious choice for the acquisition. But yeah, I guess like most of the like great VCs just like like believe in the team, believe in the company, and that's like it was going to create value for the consumer. So that's the only way to go. Okay. I, I believe that uh, since technology companies and technology entrepreneurship is coming to these old line industries, like we mentioned earlier on this panel, and you know partially because we all have smartphones these days because of broadband penetration, then uh, we're able to create tech, new technology businesses that are nonetheless understandable because they're in a legacy market. So that then there's room for many more acquirers that are like old line industry companies and not just leading global technology companies, uh, which, you know, by and large are based in the United States, by and large are based in Silicon Valley, uh, who are large and acquisitive. Um, but if, you know, there's a food delivery consolidator or some, you know, someone like a Rocket Internet or someone tries to execute, uh, you know, Uber competitor roll up, um, like those kinds of businesses, you know, can be started anywhere and that, you know, they're easy to understand. and. They should, there should be acquirers everywhere. Interesting. So you, you believe maybe we'll see some, some people from the sectors that are getting disrupted themselves doing the acquisitions in the near future? Absolutely. 
Great. I'm going to ask one last question to the panelists, uh, and then we'll wrap up. A startup that we've never heard of that you think is pretty awesome. Last year, I learned on this panel about Secret. Uh, it took them less than one year to die, <laughs> but <laughs> the trend is still alive and kicking. Uh, but it was something new that I, I learned last year. I'd love to learn, and we'd love to hear from you, a startup that is flying under our radars that we should know about. Oof. It's this is. Well, I can, I mean, I was going to do a plug for one of our portfolio companies, but I don't, I'm not sure whether that's answering your question, but uh, is, 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 that, is that a good way to answer your question? If it's, if we probably don't know about it. <laughs> okay, so look, one company we're very excited about is a company called Grime Games, which we invested in in Turkey. So it's a company that um, built four or five different games initially, and they all failed, okay? And they were pretty much out of cash. They had, not, you know, maybe four or five months of cash left. Um, and, um, and then they, they produced one more game called 1010. And, um, and this is a team of seven people in a small office in Istanbul. And, um, and that game just hit it on the nail. Um, this was about a year ago they did that. And this game doesn't have any virtual goods. It's all advertising based. Um, and the game is now generating close to $2 million a month in revenues, which is not bad for a team of seven people. Um, so, and, and now they've launched a new game, which actually has virtual goods, which is about to be released in the US, um, building on 1010. So we're very, very excited about what those guys are doing. And, um, and they're a very talented team. Great. 1010, a company to look out for. Other companies to look out oh, for? I recently invested in a company called Outreach, which is a next generation sales automation. And uh, I invest in marketing tech and enterprise SaaS pretty frequently. And uh, the trend I see is this uh, companies win their market segment by having more sales efficiency. And uh, basically, uh, my analogy is that sales reps are turning into cyborg terminator sales reps, where little pieces of the work that they do are being automated slice by slice so they can be these cyborg reps. And uh, outreach is a tool that helps them uh, do that. I'll take a couple of cy cyborg reps <laughs> once, you, once you're ready. <laughs> I'm in. Interesting. Other companies? Uh, I can name one. Um, it's like a very uh, early stage company, but um, I believe in the team and the value of the product, which is like an um, indoors uh, navigation um, software. Uh, it's like a company called Pointer. Uh, it's coming from Turkey. Um, so they're getting like great uh, reviews also of, like, from the, like, the providers, like the hardware providers like Qualcomm. So I believe there's like a great opportunity and the team is pretty awesome, so. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, from my perspective, again, talking about portfolio companies, we have about 110 of those. So really difficult to pick one, but we just invested in a really exciting new technology, which is a headset uh, where you can listen to music, but it also measures your brain waves. So generally, it can serve several purposes. Uh, yeah, mapping your brain, like the, the whole thing is around your ear, and it's almost as accurate. So the big hats which you kind of put on your head, and actually it measures your brain activity. But A, it's going to know, do you like this song or not? So I can skip it. But also, it's going to track and measure your brain activity throughout. So it can predict early stage kind of problems with, uh, you know, uh, stroke or, or any other kind of problems with health, health problems it can detect. So so. Very excited about that. I mean, they're going to have about a year of development now. Uh, hopefully, they're going to hit the market early next one. Very interesting. Good. Probably you want to add one? Again, if we're speaking about the portfolio, we are looking very actively at the services marketplace across the different regions like Eastern Europe, Russia, MENA, Turkey, India. So I do believe that they will be like a huge, um, huge like star in the next like one or two years. Great. Panelists, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your insights. Really interesting discussion. And uh, please join us outside. The panelists will be available to around today, answer your questions, connect with you. Thank you, audience, and thank you.